This could probably be a, a good gift vehicle, as long as you took away all the 20mm and definitely reduced its bomb load, because remember, it never flew with any of them, it never flew with the 20s or the 7s or the bombs, it never flew uh, with any of them, so therefore those are just kind of manufacturer's standards, and uh, looking at the rest of the way this thing flew, I don't think it could carry nearly 10,000 kilos worth of bombs. I'm just going to put it out there, especially with all the other ammunition on board and all of the the other crew because this thing had a crew of 11 on top of the uh, 100 um, over 100 people that it could also carry like this thing is just a monolith maybe one day we'll get something like this in game but it would have to be like a gift vehicle like the tb3 and it would have to be useless it would be fun though um i'd i can understand why they're like you know it's uh they you know they talk about how it wouldn't be very good and um, and one of the, one of the issues that you do have in these games is that people want good vehicles. You know, one of the issues I've been trying to struggle with over the last few years is for me, I want an event vehicle to be um, to be good but not meta, and I want it to be useful uh, at its BR, but I don't want it to dominate at its BR. And so imagine something like a KV220 or a T5. Those would be examples of bad event vehicles in my opinion but something like a key 94 2 which offers you a different playstyle uh from the key 84 and the n1k i would say that's a good event premium because it, it offers you a different way to play the game it's still good in its own right and it still is competitive it's just not meta and i know a lot of people don't see it like that because they see it as i put in all this effort i want something really good out of it i understand but just from a a long a long Longevity point of view. I think that is just a, a not a good way of doing it because then if you get new players into the game and they're getting stomped by all of these event vehicles and they can't touch them unless they spend hundreds of dollars on the Gaijin market, then you know what does uh, what does that do? Like it, it's obviously not good for them. The next question is: You have done very cool radar station mechanics, but there is no one to shoot down at the top ranks. There is no aircraft entering the attacker zone in the right of, uh, range of anti-aircraft except the 2C6. Uh, maybe you need to lower the requirements for aviation at the highest ranks. The answer is: We will analyze the statistics on the use of aviation at the higher ranks, and we'll make a decision based on the results. In addition, we are reworking and improving the radar warning system to make it more convenient to use. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, you know, the the uh, the radar system. When you look at when it was first implemented, in the form of just the you know the indicator on these top tier. Uh, AAs, it's it's miles better. It's amazing. Like it it is come on leaps and bounds over the last few months and last year or so, and it should be congratulated to Gaijin for putting in this wonderful mechanic. And hopefully it does improve, especially with some of the issues uh, that have been brought up uh, when it comes to the bug reports. So the the thing is with it is if you look at modern combat and the way that it kind of goes out. If you don't have air superiority on over an area, uh, you're not really going to see, or you shouldn't really see a lot of uh, emissions from the air. Um, you will have one force which will come along, and you'll be, let's say you have two uh, forces, forces fighting over a neutral zone, what you'll have is you'll have one force which walks up with a bunch of SAM sites and kind of just sit there and cover their own airspace, and then you'll have the other side which will park themselves on the other side with their set of SAM sites, and then you'll fight over the neutral zone, and if any aircraft comes anywhere near, it'll get shot down by the SAMs. So you can see, or, well, you know, that's the theory I should say. The main thing with it is that is basically how modern combat uh, has uh, its way if you're fighting over a small area and uh, in Grand Realistic, in Grand Arcade, well you are, you're fighting over a small area. So having this uh, system where anything on the ground is able to kill anything on the air with extreme prejudice makes complete sense in that regard. But also you've got to remember 
There aren't many countries which make vehicles uh, today. It's like the Tunguska, like the ADATS. You know, the ADATS program, even though it's really cool in game, it failed. It didn't get through, and a lot of people say it was funding-wise. And yeah, fair enough, but if it was definitely... You know, if it was definitely worth it, they would have found the funding. Then you look at other machines so with their mobile uh, system defenses, which are still in service, which are good. But the main uh, anti-aircraft role is definitely sta stationary stuff, like EG with Britain, stuff like the Rapier missile system, right? So the main thing that I'm trying to get at is, I think in game, you're going to have a feast or famine scenario. You're going to have, uh, you had the feast scenario when the jets, before all of this lock-on stuff came in, had access to stuff like HVARs, which were one-shotting tanks. You had access to a lot of uh, great ordnance to kill everything. Then they added in the point-and-click stuff, uh, you know, the, the lock-on, so that switched it back to ground vehicles. Then you had the addition of the FJ-4 uh, with its um, bullpups, and then you have a, you had a few other vehicles with them, but mainly the FJ-4, so that swung back to stuff like the FJ-4. Then you've got these new radar systems, and the only one which came out on top was the Tunguska because of the missiles, and so, you know, other machines, they may not have been able to get close, but at least, uh, especially in the form of helicopters, they would be able to come in and do some damage because they could outrange a lot of stuff as long as you weren't against the Tunguska, and now you have it fully fledged in, you know, in the side of the ground uh, because of all of these missile launches. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's completely impossible to get through with a jet. Uh, I'm sure there are many really skilled pilots who can, but it's definitely a lot harder than it was before, and that shows that it is a feast for the ground and definitely more of a famine for the sky. And the only thing that will... Um, a re uh, what I think is what will happen is we're going to get the other side of the coin again, uh, which would be stuff like the A-10 and the Su-25, especially the Su-25T, and uh, these will bring in missiles which will outrange the missile carriers. Right, so the, just uh, as an example, the A-10 Warthog, if allowed in its full conglomeration or configuration, sorry, in game, would have access to the Maverick missile. The Maverick missile has a range of around 20 kilometers. Uh, so there's nothing in game that gets even close to that uh, when it comes to uh, the ground missile launches. So once again, feast or famine. You know, the feast will be for the A-10s uh, or for the Su-25s or, or for similar machines. Whereas for the other side... Uh, maybe they bring in something else, such as even better uh, missile launchers, such as that one that the Soviets, ha oh, sorry, the Russians have right now, which I can't remember, but it's a massive thing. I just, uh, I can't remember its name. So yeah, I think we're just going to have this constant flip of a coin, depending on the update, which is going to be better. But uh, it should, if if we went on modern life and and we got away and we took away the stationary SAM systems since we don't have them in game right now, the uh, the coin would be firmly on the side of the aircraft. Uh, so we have 2016 vehicles in game, you know, in the form of the Japanese Type 16, and then 2010 vehicles in the form of the H1Z. Imagine if we had modern day airplanes uh, to face these ground vehicles. They wouldn't exist. The nobody would go in them. Uh, the airplanes would rule all. Uh, so yeah, it's just it's one of those balancing acts that's going to keep toing and froing. I think Gamescom will give us a good indication, or hopefully they go to Gamescom. Uh, Gamescom will give a good indication of uh, what's going to happen with those uh, types of mechanics. The next question is, Jet Aviation is developing more and more, however consistent problem jets have always faced in game is lack of fuel in certain situations. Is there any new plans for the addition of external droppable fuel tanks in aircraft that had them? The answer is not planned uh, for now, but we do not exclude the implementation of such a system. Um, so the premise of this one is a little bit odd. Uh, I've never heard anybody go... You know what I really need in this situation? Drop tanks. Uh, I have definitely seen arguments for external or droppable fuel tanks. For me personally, 
the reason to add them with, would be from a cinematic point of view. We have some amazing cinematic uh, makers in War Thunder uh, right now, and I think uh, whenever you watch like a World War II documentary or World War II film, and you see planes going into a fight, and they're about to engage the fight, and then the drop tanks come off, it's kind of like a you know a DEFCON one scenario where you know you hit the drop tanks, and now you're ready for battle. Let's go in. It's a good indicator for that stuff. And I think you could use it really well in cinematics to look absolutely wonderful. The problem is, from a gameplay point of view, you're not really supposed to be fighting um, enemies with external or droppable fuel tanks on. Uh, at least uh, from at least uh, from like at least my World War Two knowledge, you just wouldn't do that. You would drop them uh, before you got into combat. So uh, I'm not sure. I well, I do understand how it would help from a gameplay point of view because you'd be heavier and you'd have more fuel. You could outlast the enemy, and also you could get a better dive in. But I like from a realistic point of view, it doesn't make a lot of sense, which is why I think they haven't added it. But from an aesthetic point of view, from a uh, from a oh what's the word from a cinematic point of view i would love to see them in game uh the next question is the start of the helicopters part so it's our radio warfare systems for aircraft and helicopters in development how close are they to be added to the game the answer is at the moment we're refining the radar warning systems to make them more convenient and informative uh, in particular, different warnings for radar and homing lock, more precise positioning of the radar sourcing, etc. In future, we'll probably consider radio warfare or even anti-radar missiles. Don't tell me you'll consider it. You're looking into it now. Like, <laughs> just, yeah. Uh, basically, if you, if you see, we will probably consider this. This means we're already looking into it. We're already testing it. Like, it, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. So there, there is no way they are not already working on this stuff there is no way that anti-radar missiles are not some not a system of mechanics which are being worked on now that is just it would be ridiculous if that wasn't the case anyway uh the other stuff is uh, they're making the existing mechanics more precise, they're making it more clearer to the individual. These are all great things. Uh, this is what has to happen to make sure that, you know, the game is understood by a lot of people and that it is uh, one of those things that is just easier to understand what's going on on the battlefield. It is also why uh, stuff like the chat wheel, you know, if you hit T in uh, aircraft or tanks, it's why I would like to see it expanded so you can be more clearer with what's going Going on with your team, just like here, how Gaijin wants to be clearer with what's going on with your helicopter. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice uh, if that was the case, and I do definitely agree with uh, adding those systems. The next question is: the aircraft have new construction parts which can be shot off. How is it and such things in helicopter? Uh, how is it with such things in helicopters? Sure, they have less construction parts, but is it also possible to expand the range of damage, vibrations, incorrect operation of the propeller pitch, damage on the AT gem guidance system, etc.? The answer is, at the moment, helicopters have a damage system which is similar to the system on aircraft, but taking into account the design features of the former, such as propeller shafts and transmissions. For now, we are satisfied with the detailing of the damage model. In general, the logic of the realization for any system in the DM is quite simple. It should give new and interesting gameplay, either for the shooter, in this case, uh, you need to be able to hit any specific part separately, or for those on whom are fired upon. Uh, I think that I've, that I know there's, there's definitely, I've talked to a lot of people who want more precise damage models for helicopters. Uh, they definitely feel like when they shoot them, a lot of the time, uh, it doesn't work properly, or it seems like they struggle to hit a component, or maybe, you know, they're overpenning with specific rounds. Uh, I understand all of them. I think they're fine right now. Uh, I don't really see an issue with the helicopter damage model. Could it be a bit more precise? Yeah. Uh, does it really need to be? No, not really. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's fine uh, how it is uh, overall. At least how it's implemented in the game. If we start getting machines like the Eurocopter Tiger and we start getting composite armor for them and, you know, more little advanced techniques instead of it just being a, a shell case to hold 80 gems, then yeah, okay, we can, we can have a, we can have a chat about improved damage models. 
the next question is, are there plans to add the helicopter vehicle card such important parameters as the range of the ATGM? The answer is yes, this information should be added to the vehicle card. In addition, we have some ideas of how to refine the helicopter's HUD or HUD, uh, and there is room for displaying the permitted launch range. Good, uh, that's awesome. More information is good, information is power. The more we know, the better it is. Uh, the Americans and British also had, by the way, this question is just hilarious to me. The Americans and British also had the H-34, the Westland Wessex uh, to the British, that's uh, its name, uh, which were both capable of a range of armament preset, uh, pr presents. I think that's supposed to be presets. Uh, is it possible we will see these variants in the respective tree as well as the current French H-34? Answer, there is a chance. Uh, so... <laughs> You know how before, uh, you know, there was the, the anti-radar thing where they're like, we're, we're probably considering this, we're not sure what we're doing. They're definitely considering it, and they're definitely testing it. Uh, they, they would be, it would be incredible to me if they're not. But the, the, this one here is like, you, you know when you, you have like that PR team and you're like, throw us a lowball question where we can promote something and maybe get people's hands, you know, thinking, this is that question. All of the other ones, like in this, even the K7 one, the K7 one makes no sense really. It's just to try and get you interested in what this machine is and maybe get some feedback on it. But the hell, this one is the reason why this is not out of the blue and this to me just sounds like a complete PR question is because of this. I covered this uh, a few months ago. It was added to the dev server, and it's an American version of the H-34. Now, it has a cockpit. Uh, we'll just uh, have a cockpit. Uh, there we go. Don't break on me, thank you. Uh, it, it has a cockpit. Uh, it has all of the different rockets. It has a gun pod on it. It has ATGMs. It has all of the guns. And remember, when uh, when you see a machine like this in its... Uh, in its uh, War Thunder uh, asset viewer form. It has all of the secondary armaments built on top of each other. So don't think that this is like, you know, what, <laughs> what you would get in the game. But you can see it has 50 cals, it has 30 cals, there's a 20 millimeter on it. You've got a bunch of different rockets, probably AP and HE. Then you've got some 80 gems at the bottom there, or at least an 80 gem holder. And then you've got some bomb racks as well. Here's the 80 gem holder down here. So this H34 has access to everything, and it's obviously different to the French one because well you can just tell by its uh, armaments right like what is this thing uh, this crazy thing but yeah I made a video talking about this and what it is and all of its separate armaments so just type in h34 on the channel you may um you know you'll be able to see it i'll leave a link actually as, as a pinned comment if you're interested but yeah this has been sat in the war thunder dev files for a few months and my idea is that this is going to be one of the operation summer vehicles we had uh, earlier in the year a uh we had earlier in the year the sea voyage event, uh, which was the leningrad the ship uh event with uh, along with the pbm we haven't had a helicopter uh event yet and this to me is screaming a helicopter event you know it has a ton of different cool armaments it's not going to be overpowered it's going to be an i know it's going to have access to everything it's going to get more people into helicopters but my god is this like the layup question like dude, this is this is the layup shot for the dunk man. Like I I <laughs> because it's just completely out of nowhere. Uh, but yeah, this this is already in the game, or at least it's on the dev server. And if if it does become the Operation Summer Vehicle, or one of them, would not be a surprise. But there is a chance. Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> like goddamn. Uh, are there? <laughs> The next question is, are there any chances for lightly armed uh, scout helicopters with a scouting mechanic that could work like light tanks? Certain current ones, such as the Gazelle, could also be considered for this. The answer is, we have some doubts for that. Uh, unlike light tanks, the helicopter can overview the whole location from one point, which will make uh, such scouting too easy for them. For sure, the presence of anti-aircraft missile systems complicates it a little, but still, you can stay out of range of anti-aircraft missile systems and observe the entire map. That's why uh, to award such scouting on the same way as light tanks is not right. Uh, I think that's true. You would have to put in a different mechanic because it is a different scenario. And um, I actually talked to this with a few people, and I think Tazzy 
who's an admin over on the uh, Tech Hub Discord. And if you haven't wished him happy birthday, make sure to DM him or PM him or ping him on the Discord to say happy birthday. It's Tazzy135. And anyway, uh, the <laughs> he'll enjoy that. Uh, the thing is, with it, uh, what you could do is to get rid of the issues of it uh, skirting the outside of the map and just being able to spot everything, why not do it in a form of kind of like an area of effect idea? So if you are, let's say, within a thousand meters of an area, you can cast, you can cast like a circular blanket on the battlefield and it spots uh, everything in that area for let's say five seconds and then you turn it off for like 30 seconds and then you hit it again and it turns on for five seconds so for that for that period of time that small period of time you can uh, see in a specific part of the map the concentration of tanks and what's in it right i think that would be a much better way of doing helicopters it would also mean that you would have to be closer to the battlefield so you couldn't skirt everything and you would be better than the uh, light scout so because you could do multiple targets at once by just casting the shadow over and uh, being able to spot everything but it is a massive risk reward because well you don't have anything else that can really be used to kill anything and also uh you know it could be a detriment to your team if you're not able to scout anything and you get shot down within like a second so yeah uh, i think if you're going to implement a system like that that's how you do it i think it would work pretty well the uh, next part is the naval stuff. So uh, the first question is, it's been some time since the VS-8 appeared during the minefield test event. Can you tell us any news about mines and this vessel in particular? The answer, uh, sorry, the last patch in terms of the fleet was very large. We simply didn't have time to implement mines on different platforms, but we do have plans uh, for such type of weapons. So when the uh, v the VS-8 was introduced in its gift vehicle form, where kind of like the limited gift vehicle idea, I thought it was a great way of testing a mechanic and also getting some information on it, and also only giving it to the people who really wanted it. You know, you had to do a set of challenges to get it. It would be nice if in the future, you know, they did that way to test other mechanics. I think stuff like the bullpup, uh, you know, the pullpup AGM, could be a would have been a great uh, mechanic to test that with so we wouldn't have the issues uh, that we had with the camera uh, that we had for a little bit uh, when it was introduced but anyway uh, the vs8 when it came to the mines themselves were incredibly fun to use uh, i like the fact that you could use them uh, very much in an aggressive defensive posture basically if you were able to push past a point you could defend the point uh, with mines and uh, you know not too much else the only issue issue is it was not one of those machines which could get you in that front front foot position first so you would have to rely on your allies for the first five minutes of the battle and then you as the vs8 could control the rest of the battle for or after that five minutes as long as you know you kept uh, on on side with your minds and you know you didn't let them time out uh, and not be replaced so uh, I thought it was really cool. The mines themselves, they hold broke everything, including, including the largest light cruisers. If you want to have a look at the VS-8, you know, we did do a video on it as well, along with all of the testing for it. Uh, what it was doing is when it blew up a machine, it was creating two versions of them. <laughs> so that was uh, pretty cool. But I, I, I liked the mechanic. I thought it was great. The animations on the VSA were great. I can't wait to see it come to naval. I think it's definitely one of those mechanics which is much more revolutionary than depth charges, which I think are incredibly limited, whereas mines are much more of a tactical usage uh, than the depth charges themselves. So I'm looking forward to that. Is there any news regarding any progress on submarines? Is it something being internally tested or has it been ruled out for now? Whilst uh, they are slow, there are many slower vessels in the game, and we have plenty of anti-submarine vessels at lower ranks. Uh, the answer is not yet, so uh, that's basically, is there any news? Uh, well, last April Fool's, not the alien one, but the one before, we tested submarines. Uh, it's as simple as that. So we know that there's at least some basic stuff there when it comes to submarines. Uh, on top of this as well... Um, I have my big doubts on submarines, not just the slowness of them, which a lot of people pick up on when I talk about them, but the other issue is secondary armaments are lacking, and also uh, the fact that uh, a lot of maps are just not set up for them. 
So a lot of maps are designed around this island idea and uh, submarines are not great around islands, especially when they need a clear look on the target. So unless there's a fundamental change in how the map design works, I don't see how submarines fit. I've talked about them before, I'll probably talk about them again, uh, but I don't want to go into them this time. The next question is, lots of the newer larger vessels have beautifully modelled aircraft on them that we don't yet have in game. Uh, is there any chance these aircraft will be introduced? The, there are chances that this aircraft uh, has, there's a lot of spelling mistakes in this one, uh, that should be these aircraft, has some combat value in the game, uh, but it is also required to understand that aircraft models for some, uh, for ships, are created a little easier than fully fledged models for players, so we would need to create such models from scratch. Uh, yeah, there is some, if you look at some of the Japanese ships, or stuff like the uh, HMS Southampton, there's some really cool um, there's some really cool planes just kind of sat on them as reconnaissance planes, and some of them you could, you know, bring into the game. There's a lot of float planes that Japan is missing right now, and a lot of stuff from Britain, and yeah, they would be like rank 1, battle rating 1.0 machines, but they'd still be fun. A lot of people have talked about how it would be nice if a lot of these aircraft could be used in an AI form, or even a player form, in uh, naval battles as reconnaissance machines. I think there's also room for that too. Uh, the question, well, especially when if we get larger and larger ships with the ranges that's going to be going on there. So yeah, uh, I, I hope they do come into the game in more of a HD format, and therefore are added to the game, as long as they have some functionality in the form of either... Um, you know, primary armaments in the form of guns or some bombs or something. Uh, so we don't just have aircraft which are dilly-dallying around. <clears throat> I would like some uh, uh, some alternate objectives, though, for machines which aren't specifically designed to take on other machines. Like, uh, I've always thought um, Sea Rescue would be kind of cool. Like, you have, uh, you have just a random event which happens on a map, and uh, you have to go and land your uh, naval, well, land your uh, aircraft in the area uh, to collect the passengers. And if you save them, maybe you get a bit more tickets uh, or something like that, you know, uh, because it's seen as you saving uh, some of your crew uh, because, you know, the ship has been sunk or something like that. I think that would be really cool uh, to see in, but, you know, uh, I've, I've talked about these ideas years ago, uh, so we'll see. I mean, I talked about these ideas when the Kingfisher got removed. Uh, you know, that's how long ago that was. The next question is, are there plans for a new naval tree this year besides Japan? And the answer is yes, there are some plans, and even more, we're already working on this. It's been incredibly impressive how fast uh, naval has been uh, put into the game after the release of open beta. Yes, it was development uh, in development for a long time, especially in the uh, early stages when it was just stuff like PT boats, but when you think about it, once it hit open beta, you had the Soviet Navy, the German Navy, the American Navy, and now you've got the uh, British Navy and the Japanese Navy, and they've added a bunch of like cruisers, heavy cruisers, destroyers, like there's a ton of stuff they've added to naval over the last year alone. And I don't think it's even been an open beta for a year, has it? It may have, it may have just crested the uh, year mark. So the amount of effort that is going into naval and the amount of ships and the amount of mechanics and the amount of, you know, different things is incredible over this last year. Like, uh, it is absolutely incredible and definitely not worth uh, what is getting out of it, but hopefully in the long run, uh, you know, it's, uh, it does show the numbers that it should compared to the game modes. My, uh, my, my bet is that it's on uh, Italy, uh, the next nation. The first thing is we've seen an Italian destroyer uh, in some of the closed beta stuff. And also, the other thing is... Uh, with Italy, they have a lot more of a defined rank 1 and 2. Uh, I've talked about this uh, with a few people. Go and have a look at like French PT boats. I might do a video on them at some point. But they're really uh, old school, I think is the way to put them. Uh, we're talking like early 18... No, sorry, late 1800s old school and World War One old school. They kind of got rid of the idea 
uh, because it just didn't really work for them. So the rank 1 and 2 for France is not looking great, but the, the rank 3 and 4 should be good. Uh, the Italians have much more of a fleshed out tree. Uh, they have a lot of more obvious options. Uh, so for me, uh, I would be incredibly surprised if we see uh, France before Italy. But anything's possible, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, I, I just, I think the Italian one would be a lot more fun uh, than the French one. And also, uh, think about it this way, the PGO2. Uh, you remember the the one with the minigun, yeah? The one that everybody hates. Uh, it went up in BR, it's still got its high rate of fire. So it's amazing how everybody shut up about it uh, now that people realize that hardly anyone plays naval. Uh, but the thing is, think about that. Give it two anti-ship missiles. Uh, so, you know, and it's in its normal configuration. And uh, replace, that, uh, replace that minigun with uh, the automatics gun. Uh, that that's the Italian version of the PGO2. Have fun with that. That's going to be fun when that gets added, and I'm pretty sure I'll be incredibly surprised if that ain't a premium. Uh, so the last two are the other questions. So the first question is: Are there any works in progress regarding total or full destructibility? The answer is: Destructibility has always been working within acceptable limits for a long time. Large houses fall apart, taking damage from shells of sufficient power. But we need to take care about performance values on the client side, as well as about gameplay in which buildings often play an important role. Total destructibility can harm the balance. Uh, I do agree with that. Um, how, like, if you had complete physical destructibility, where stuff like houses, when they crumbled, they didn't disappear and they just stayed on the map. Imagine how many streets and stuff you could block off with that. Uh, you know, you could just knock down a building and make sure that nobody else moves uh, past it. It's it, it, it's a massive headache. Uh, but if we talk about the actual destructibility element and then, you know, disappearing element, it's massively improved. Um, American Desert over this year has got full destructibility from the ground, not the air, I should say. Um, st maps like Tunisia have full destructibility. Um, the only ones which to me are kind of a surprise that they don't are Italy and also Maginot Line uh, with its town. But everything else has a lot of destructibility in it. Uh, so for me, I think it's pretty good right now. You know, it's uh, it's in a good place um, <laughs> when it comes to it. I, I, I do still want that scenario that I remember in Battlefield Bad Company where you would be playing Gold Rush and you would be fighting, you know, into a village. When you started fighting into that village, it would be all nice and people would be taking, you know, quite high positions, maybe sniping, all of this stuff. And by the end, uh, when you'd either blown up the two Gold Rush areas or... If uh, you weren't able to, the whole place would be flattened uh, because of either C4 or tanks or whatever. It was the first game that I played where I was like, holy hell, destructibility is a real damn thing in this game. <laughs> like, it was it was mind-blowing to me because before that, I, I had never seen levels of destruction on that level where map design or, or, or playability of a map wasn't just based on the buildings that you started with but it was also based on what you could destroy and the different ways you could play the battle it was incredibly cool and it still is incredibly cool to me that we can do it in war thunder uh, especially with maps like alaska which have a ton of destructibility on them i would i would say they're doing really well in that department and yes uh, there are a few maps as i said that are lacking Maginot and italy come to mind but the majority of them are very good and incredibly fun to just go around knocking stuff over. The next question is, how do the developers assess the last launch of the World War? Should we wait for radical changes in the mechanics of it? For example, possibility of fleet participation or the awarding the commanders with the points? The answer is, in our opinion, yes, it was very good. Now, in the first season of the World War, several thousand squadrons took part and helped us to improve the game mode. In the future, we don't exclude the appearance of the fleet in battles and additional motivation for the squadron commanders. Uh, it's the, the fleet participation isn't that big of a thing for me. Uh, I do think it should be a part of it since, you know, War Thunder is supposed to be the three major aspects of it, air, fleet, uh, air, naval, and ground. Uh, so, yeah, it, it should be there. I would definitely want to focus on the issues I brought up 
uh, in the uh, World War video, the issues with matchmaking, and also the issues with the commanders, because the commanders were not compensated for their time at all. Uh, so those issues, yes, uh, they are much more important to me than adding in naval, uh, which wouldn't really solve anything. It would just add more issues. So let's get the initial issues sorted and then move on. But I am incredibly optimistic about World War Mode. Really enjoyed the first season. Can't wait uh, for the next one and get Tech ES involved in it too. Anyway, uh, that is all of the q and I would say it's a, it's a good Q&A. There's a lot of stuff to this one. Uh, a lot of really interesting answers and a lot of ones which definitely feel like PR. Hey, we're trying to hint towards stuff. Uh, so there's a little bit of everything for everyone. Anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank B. Young, Blackie, Daniel Stanton, John Reinman, Leonard Rudnick, Martinez, Matity, Moxie, Nick Graham, Alobrolo, Super Cacti, Elove Goats, and Seductive Trashcan for supporting the channel.